We're in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 2. We're going to read down from verse 1 to verse 11. Romans chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 11. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest or dost the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. There's no miscarriage of justice with God. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honour and immortality eternal life but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile, but glory, honour and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God." Looking forward to getting into this today because some great questions, questions that we, old chestnuts as we talk about, that will come up. And um, some great answers for this as well. Remember that the book of Romans, especially what we're reading here, is written, to, uh, not, you know, not just to Christians, but to Gentiles and Jew. Three classes of people. In that sense, the Bible talks about Jew, Gentile and the Christian. We're finishing off from verse... Four, verse 4 or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance we were saying about how God allows suffering if you remember last time I know we've left it a couple of weeks since um, we were talking about God, how God allows suffering regarding the Christian, the non-Christian and the Christian. And the Lord will let a Christian suffer to make him heavily minded, to prove to the Christian that his promises are sure, to make a Christian sympathetic with other people, to allow that Christian to be in a place where he can experience the power of the Holy Spirit, to teach the Christian patience, to prove his grace is sufficient. We were mentioning those things last time. The Lord will allow a Christian to suffer for different reasons. An unsaved man only suffers for one reason, to wake them up and show them their need of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, because God does not want them to go to hell. And one of the surest proofs that there is a hell is by the way that God lets certain things happen to people in order to keep them out of hell. God does not want anybody to go to hell, no matter what the Calvinist says. And I'll be kicking Calvinism throughout this sermon with great glee. <laughs> and as often as it rears its ugly head, and we've said before, it has an, uh, an ugly head, we will um, certainly be treading on those tulips. Do you know that there is something worse? Listen carefully. There is something worse in life than your baby or your child dying. Do you know that there is something worse in life than bereavement? There is something worse in but I say in life, there is something worse than losing your limbs, your legs, your arms, 
There's something worse than that. Sometimes we think, I couldn't picture anything worse than that. Losing my loved one. Losing a limb. A soldier goes overseas and he fights for his country and he comes back with his legs blown off or his arms gone or he's blinded. You know what? There is something worse than that. I'd never heard the term until a few weeks back of locked-in syndrome. Didn't know what it was. Then obviously it's made public and it's not a... Um, it's quite a rare occurrence in, in the world where somebody has a stroke and they have locked-in syndrome. They can't move any part of their body. They can communicate through their eyelids. That's it. They're in a wheelchair. They need to be fed. They need to have somebody take them to the toilet and help them in every area of their life. They can't feed or clothe themselves. You cannot picture how bad that is. You know, I couldn't imagine that, what it would be like. You would think that would be the worst thing in the whole world. You're totally reliant on everything. You're just existing. You're just there. You're just existing. You can't talk to anybody. How must it feel? It must be the worst thing out. So the guy last week, or the week before, wanted to take his own life. He communicated to his eyelids that he wanted to have assisted suicide. Hence why we have this um, debate or discussion on euthanasia. I can understand that he wants to take his own life. I don't agree with it, but I can understand it, if that makes any sense. I can't think, you know, of anything worse than that. But the Bible says there is something worse than that. These things that I've just mentioned about the baby dying, bereavement, locked in syndrome, and you could pick a million other things that are horrific. They are horrific. You don't want to experience any of those things, of course. May God keep us from these things. But there is something worse than all of these things. All of those things added together, there is something worse. And that is this. Hell. Spending an eternity in hell is worse than all of those things put together. The trouble is, the Western world doesn't understand that. You could have locked in syndrome from day one to the day you die, living 70 years, and it is nothing compared to hell fire to spend in an eternity in the lake of fire. God wants the unsaved man to seek his face and surrender to him. To turn to God no matter what he is going through. God wants to save the unsaved. God wants to save you. The person with locked in syndrome, God wants to save they have the ability within them, in their mind. If they can communicate through their eyelids, they have the ability to seek God. And God can save them. And God can comfort them and give, an, give them an understanding about himself, about life, about the meaning of life and the purpose to it all. Even though they can't move a muscle. But going to hell, that's the worst thing ever. Spending an eternity in hell. And yet the majority of people will go there because they have rejected the word of God, they have rejected God and God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants to save the sinner. 
turn to 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. Two Peter three verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us would, long suffering to us would, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to repent and turn to him because he knows what is best for you. The trouble is mankind thinks he knows best. There is a way, the Bible says in there, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Ezekiel 18 verse 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? What a great verse that is. God gets no pleasure from the death of the wicked. Look at verse 32, same chapter. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. And then Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? In Romans 2.4 we read that God is long-suffering, or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. He's long-suffering. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. You'll suffer in this life at different, you know, in different areas, different degrees. We all suffer at some point in our lives. But what we go through is something much, much worse. That's ahead of us. And that is hellfire. You can escape hell by trusting in Jesus Christ for your sins forgiven. By asking him to forgive you of all your sins. You can escape hell. Not from your head, from your heart. To really mean it. In 1 Timothy 2, 4 we read this. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. He will have all men to be saved. He wants everybody to get saved, but he's not forcing you. He can't force you. You have a freedom to choose. You have a freedom to choose. Choose life, the Bible says. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death, for every man. Not what the idiotic Calvinist teaches about limited atonement tasting death just for the elect. He tasted death for every man. He is not willing that any should perish. It is a ridiculous, nonsensical notion to believe that you were predestined before the foundation of the world to go to hell with not the opportunity of getting saved. It's a wicked, wicked doctrine. And you talk about heresy, Calvinism is heresy in all four points. Plus one, five, thank you. Tulip, T-U-L-I-P, every one of them. Every petal is heresy. Calvinism. The five points of Calvinism. Listen to this. We put this in the latest newsletter. Issue 61 of Time for Truth News. And this needs to go on CD. And people need to present this to the Calvinists because it's such a ridiculous, wicked doctrine. Listen to this carefully. Questions to ask the tulip-sniffing Calvinist. It's on page 24. 
How do you know you are one of the elect? How do you know that you're one of the elect? How do you know your salvation experience was genuine? How do you know you were regenerated and given the gift of faith? You need to ask these to a Calvinist, these questions. How do you know that your faith is genuine? That it came as a gift from God and not from yourself? How do you know? How do you know you have the right kind of faith or enough faith? How do you know? How do you know you are truly saved, one of the elect, and will persevere in good works and godliness till the end of your life. How can anyone know? Yet in 1 John 5 verse 13, it says that we can know that we have eternal life. If the faith to believe in Jesus Christ is given through irresistible grace as a gift, why does the Bible command and exhort us to believe in Jesus Christ. Why give commandments and commands that are impossible to obey? No one is perfect and we all sin. How can one know he is truly elect and persevering to the end if there is still sin in his life or her life? How many sins indicate one is not persevering and therefore not truly elect? Don't you think these are good questions for the Calvinist? Which sins would indicate one is not persevering? <laughs> you have specific sins. Where can these answers be found in the scriptures? They can't. Calvinists believe the elect must be regenerated before, before they are given the faith to believe the gospel. But how can they be regenerated through the gospel when they can't understand the gospel until regenerated? <laughs> what a ridiculous doctrine Calvinism is. Why are there so many warnings in the Bible to believers not to drift away? Hebrews 2.1 not to fall away, Hebrews 4.11, and not to come short of the grace of God, Hebrews 12.15, not to shrink back, Hebrews 10.28, not to be carried away by unprincipled men and fall from their steadfastness, 2 Peter 3.17, and not to desert Christ, Galatians 1.6. If all the elect are, uh, are assured of persevering to the end, then why are, this, why are there all of these warnings in the scriptures? Huh? 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24 to 27 speaks of running a race for a prize. The Apostle Paul said he dis disciplined himself so he would not be disqualified. Certainly Paul was one of the elect. So how was it possible for him to be disqualified if all the elect persevere to the end? Calvinism is ridiculous. It's a moron doctrine, isn't it? It's a stupid doctrine. You're mad if you believe it. If Jesus Christ died only for the elect, which is heresy, then the unelect must be judged at the great white throne for their sins because Christ was not judged for them. Why does Revelation 20 verse 12 and 13 say that they will be judged according to their works stroke deeds? If they are to be judged for their sins, as Calvinists say, why are their sins never mentioned at this judgment? Interesting. How can God withhold grace and Christ's atonement from some of his creatures and then condemn them to the lake of fire for all eternity for not accepting what was never offered to them? That's wickedness. That's not God. God wouldn't do that. How can Christ be just, loving, compassionate and merciful if he chose to die on the cross for some when he could have easily died on the cross for everyone? 
very profound. Calvinism is wicked. Why preach, repent or perish, when the non-elect can't repent and the elect can't perish? (laughs) How can God hold the non-elect responsible for not believing and damn them for it when he deliberately did not give them the faith to enable them to believe in the first place? Great question. If Jesus Christ has already made an efficacious atonement for the sins of an elect person, is that elect person actually lost during the period prior to their being saved? During the period before an elect person gets saved, how are they condemned already for not believing when their unbelief, which is a sin, has already been paid for by Christ on the cross? Don't you, don't you see how ridiculous Calvinism is? And they class it as an intellectual doctrine. Honestly, the cleverer they think they are, the thicker they are. If repentance is a gift only given to the elect, What did Jesus mean when he said that some of the people in hell would have repented if they had had the same opportunity as the people to whom he preached? Why does the Spirit of God strive and convict some sinners who later prove by dying and going to hell that they were non-elect? What is the purpose of such movings of the Spirit? Whoever wrote these questions did a good job here. And I finish with this. Listen to this carefully. If the following is true. John Smith, could be anybody. John Davis, could be anybody. John Smith, (laughs) it's not me, (laughs) is deliberately foreordained to commit sin, is hated by God before he is born, is predestined to go to hell before he is born, He cannot repent because God deliberately refuses to give him the gift of repentance. He cannot believe because God deliberately refuses to give him the gift of faith. He was not, is not and never will be loved by God in the slightest degree. He was deliberately excluded from the group of people Jesus died for on the cross, the elect, so that salvation was intentionally and forever put completely out of his reach. Then how is it that John Smith's that how is it John Smith's fault that he will land up burning forever in the lake of fire. Calvinism is a wicked, unscriptural, idiotic doctrine and you are a total moron if you believe in it. Did I sugarcoat that enough? I hate Calvinism with a passion. And the more I am reading about it, the more I am studying it, it is so ridiculous, I cannot believe it. And I have had so many people in the past, when I have attacked it, attack me through the, you know, because of the newsletter. It is amazing how many people have sucked into this idiotic doctrine. Let's move on. Why get depressed <laughs> about this doctrine? Let's move on and see what the scriptures talk about. So getting back to hell, hell fire, God allows good and bad things to happen to unsaved people because he wants to reach them and save them from ending up in the lake of fire. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell, folks, because he is a loving God. He is merciful. For the Christian, we also suffer trials. Of course we do. 1 Peter 1, it's not just the unsaved, we have our trials also. Some of us have to go through a lot more than perhaps an unsaved person does. 
1 Peter 1 verse 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found under praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ I'm just starting Job again Job 23 turn there Job 23 Job 23 verse 10 But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. We have to go through our trials also. Life isn't easy, folks. You know that. Proverbs 17, verse 3. The fining pot is for silver, and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. He tries our hearts. What's our motives like? Why do we do things? For what reason? Out of love? Out of duty? Do we care? What's our motive? What's your heart like? God tries our hearts. Isaiah 48, 10. Behold, I have refined thee, but not, with, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. We have to go through afflictions at times in our lives to bring us forth as gold to bring honour and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ 1 Corinthians 3 verse 13 every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is at the judgment seat of Christ anything that is not done for the right motive gets burnt up. We want to bring honour and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Hence why we work for him, because we love him. James 1 verse 12 Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And the last one, 2 Timothy 2 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. God is going to reward us at the judgment seat of Christ. We will come forth victorious, no matter what we're going through now. A sinner down here, above all, needs mercy. Remember we looked at the, you know, the um, statues outside the court? There's no mercy at the courthouse. The guy on death row is already receiving justice for what he has done. What he needs is mercy. That's what he needs. He needs mercy. Romans 2. Romans 2 verse 5 to 11 is an amazing passage. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. The key verse to understanding this passage is verse 6. Listen carefully. A lot of Christians miss this. This is excellent stuff. Rockman does a brilliant commentary on this. And most of this is from that commentary. It's brilliant. The key verse to understanding this passage is verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his what? Deeds. Deeds. Verses 5 to 11 describes a works setup, a works situation under which the Gentiles from Noah 
to Christ lived. The Lord was watching the Gentiles throughout the Old Testament and judging them according to their works. Works. Look up the word faith in the scriptures and see how many times it appears in the Old Testament. It will shock you. The Lord was watching the Gentiles throughout the Old Testament and judging them according to their works. In the Old Testament, if the Gentile did right and continued to do right, seeking for glory and honour and immortality, God gave that Gentile eternal life. Do you see the different plans, so-called, of salvation in different dispensations? Can you see that? Turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13, for a clear example of this. Acts chapter 13. And look at verses 42 to 48. And you want to put some notes by these verses. 42 to 48. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. This is the Gentiles. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Almost the whole city. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Can you believe it? and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Isn't it amazing what jealousy and envy get you to do? They're not happy that people are getting saved. And Paul, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. The Jews rejected it, didn't want it. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were, listen carefully, ordained to eternal life, believed. Now this verse, verse 48, is used by Calvinists to so-called prove predestination. But as we've said before, predestination has nothing to do with what? The unbeliever. You're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So here, this verse, used by the Calvinists to prove destin uh, predestination, it's preposterous. As the people in this verse, who are ordained to eternal life, are ordained to eternal life on the basis of works. Look at verse 42. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. The Jews leave the synagogue without coming to Jesus. But the Gentiles want to hear the gospel. On the next Sabbath, Acts 13, verse 44 to 45, when the Gentiles came to hear the gospel preached, the Jews grew envious and blasphemed God by contradicting the gospel. 
Because of this, Paul said that the Jews had judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life. Acts 13 verse 46. Why? Because they were under God's eternal decree of reprobation before the foundation of the world. Reprobation is the Calvinistic term for a sinner who is not one of the elect and therefore predestined to damnation. So the Jews were envious, they blasphemed God, contradicting the gospel. And because of this, Paul said that the Jews had judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life. Why? Because they were under God's eternal degree of reprobation before the foundation of the world? No. Here in Acts 13, the Jews put themselves under a decree of reprobation by responding with envy and blasphemy to Paul's preaching in Acts 13, verse 45. The Gentiles were ordained to eternal life because they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, verse 48. It had absolutely nothing to do with some Calvinistic eternal decree of election. The Gentiles responded correctly to the light they had and God rewarded that response by allowing them to believe the gospel to salvation, for salvation. They accepted the light that was given to them. If it seems a little bit confusing now, hopefully it will manifest itself as we get a little bit more into this. So the Gentile, listen carefully, the Gentile is under his conscience. And whatever light God has given him, when he follows his conscience and he responds correctly to the light that God has given him, the Lord leads him to Jesus Christ. When he violates his conscience and defiles his conscience and sins against his conscience and rejects the light that God has given him, the Lord leads him to hell. Look at verse Romans 2, verse 8 and 9. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Also in Acts chapter 10, another picture, Acts chapter 10, again you'd have to read this yourself but just point out a few things here, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, Cornelius is a Gentile. He was already doing right as far as he knew what to do. Look at verse 2. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He was doing right according to the light that was given to him. He was a devout man. He was seeking glory, honour and eternal life from the one true God. He feared God. He gave much alms and prayed to God always. So he was patiently continuing in well-doing. Cornelius is the perfect example of Romans 2, verse 6 and 7, who will render every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and in immortality eternal life. That's what Cornelius was doing. The light was revealed to him. What light was revealed to him, he was obeying, he was seeking God, he was praying, he was giving his arms, and because of that, he reaped, he gained eternal life. 
He does right and God rewards him by sending him the gospel through Simon Peter. So he's on the right lines by obeying the light that God had given to him. Cornelius ends up getting saved and receiving the eternal life for which he sought. Cornelius ends up getting saved and receiving the eternal life for which he sought in the works he was doing. Does that make sense? Paul makes it clear that those two rules of thumb, so to speak, are applicable to both Jew and Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God, verse 11. In verse 17, Paul switches over to the Jews. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. His message to the Jews is that the Lord gave the law to the Jews. And if they have followed the law, then the Lord would lead them to Christ. Reject Christ and they go to hell. But the Lord didn't give his special revelation of the law to the Gentiles as a whole. They had their conscience and the word of God in nature. And you need to read Psalm 19 in regard to that. The Jews were under the law and the Gentiles were under conscience. Both used to lead them to Christ. Therefore, according to Romans 1.20, they have no excuse. Does that make sense? The law was given to the Jews, conscience and the, the amount of light given to the Gentiles, and if they sought what they were given, yeah, through their conscience, they could receive eternal life. But it was a works set up. They had to do. And things have changed. I hope that brings some understanding in regard to how somebody got saved that was not a Jew in the Old Testament. For one more example, turn to Luke 7. Luke chapter 7. Verse 3 to 5. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Notice that the Jews of Christ's day recognised the principle expounded by Paul in Romans 2, 7. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing, well-doing, verse 6 says, according to, their, to his deeds, its works, well-doing, seek for glory and honour and immortality, eternal life. And when he heard of Jesus, he, that's the Gentile Roman centurion, from verse 2, and a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. The Gentile, the Roman centurion, when he had heard of Jesus, he, the Gentile Roman centurion, sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation. And in Genesis 12, verse 3, we read, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I will bless them that bless thee. 
He was worthy. For whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. That centurion got his servant healed because of his deeds and attitude toward the nation of Israel. Very interesting because if you look at this from a tribulation point of view, looking after the Jew in the tribulation will also have this kind of an effect. It's as if it's faith and works set up again. If you go to Romans, uh, sorry, uh, Revelation, I apologise, Revelation 14, I think it is. I want faith and keeping the commandments. Faith in Jesus Christ and the commandments. Where is it? Verse 12. 14, 12. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. There it is. Works. Keep the commandments of God and faith of Jesus. Faith and works. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God works and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's faith and works. So going back to Romans 2 verse 5 to 11, it answers the old adage, which is a short statement that expresses a general truth. It answers the old chestnut of a question. What about the sinner... What about the heathen who has never heard the gospel? How many times have you been asked that question? Oh, you mean the, the dwarf pygmy who lives in Kathmandu jungle feeding on tortillas and dandelions? Oh, that one! Bit of sarcasm there. But you know what I'm talking about. Isn't it interesting that these dwarf pygmies who live in Kathmandu jungle feed on tortillas and dandelions? <laughs> uh, a little bit sarcastic. sarcasm. You've got, listen, you've got to break this up with a bit of smiling. Come on, it's a tough one. Isn't it interesting, these so-called sinners, these people who are heathen that have never heard the gospel, they know, listen carefully, they know that it is wrong to take another man's wife. They've never had the scriptures read to them. They don't know the gospel, yet they know it's wrong to take another man's wife. They know it's wrong to steal. You know, in some of these tribes, you steal, you get your hand cut off. First time. You steal again, you get your other hand cut, cut off. And if you steal again, third time, you get your head cut off, and then from then on, you don't steal anymore. They know that it's wrong to steal. They know that it's wrong to take another man's wife. How if they haven't got the scriptures? How do they know? Do you know that they, they know it's right to honour their father and their mother? I was thinking about this yesterday. They know it's right. They've never had the scriptures read to them. They don't know anything about the Ten Commandments. But they know it's right to honour their mother and their father. They know it's wrong to kill, just for the sake of it. They know it's wrong to lie. They know it's wrong to lie. How do they know all these things? Romans 2 verse 15 says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else ex excusing one another. Don't forget it's Gentile from verse 1 to 17. Verse 1 to 16, verse 17, they, Paul picks up regarding the Jew. So regarding Gentiles, they know because the law, the work of the law is written in their hearts and 
they have a conscience that guides them. Don't you think that is amazing? But we'll come to this verse as we get on into this chapter. They know it is wrong to steal, to kill, to cheat, to steal another man's wife. They know it's wrong, yet they've never had the scriptures because they have the law written in their hearts and they are guided through their conscience. So this question is answerable. What about the heathen? What about the sinners that have never had the scriptures if they follow their conscience in purity? and they follow their conscience, their conscience will lead them to Jesus Christ. Their conscience will lead them to God. And it goes back to Romans 2. So we'll render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, eternal life. We've spoken about the conscience before. It's interesting to note that it occurs in 29 verses, all of which are in the New Testament. But all through the Old Testament, if the sinner obeyed his conscience, the law written in his heart, he was seeking for well-doing, he was seeking uh, patient continuance in well-doing, seek for glory and honour and immortality, he gained eternal life. Now regarding the masses, and we're nearly through, regarding the masses in the world who aren't Christians, the millions or billions who are in Islam, the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Confucians, think of China and how many millions of people there are there. Think of all the Roman Catholics. The billions of people just in those the Islamists, Hindus, Buddhists, Confucians and the Roman Catholic. Add them all up and the billions are on the road to hell. Billions are on the road to the lake of fire and God is not willing that any should perish. What about those? How come that we get, you know, the truth and these haven't got a chance of knowing the truth? Ah, oh, but they have. Listen, here are a few factors that come into play when God deals with the heathen when God deals with those sinners in these countries. You may not agree with this, but I found this very interesting. The first is this. There is a high infant mortality rate within these countries. Many a baby in Africa, India and China dies before it's even one years old. Well, how does that affect things? Think about it. In his mercy, God takes many of those little ones home to heaven. Did you get that? Home to heaven before they have a chance to grow up and reject Christ. You may think that's harsh. But that's the mercy of God. You may not understand it, but that's the mercy of God. It is like what the Lord said of the infant son of Jeroboam in 1 Kings 14. Turn there, this is interesting. 1 Kings 14, verse 12 and 13. Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only to Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. What a great verse that is. Never seen that one before. Read it, but never seen it. How many times has that happened? Heaven is going to have a huge, a huge, a massive population and a lot of those are going to be the little ones who died before the age of accountability did you hear me? who died before the age of accountability another factor in dealing with the heathen 
in these countries is that God always has some witnesses in the midst of the masses who have the true word of God preaching and teaching. There'll always be an AV Bible believer somewhere in China, in India, in these Muslim countries, in Africa. But even when that evangelist isn't there, God will always send somebody or God will always lead the person that wants to know the truth through his conscience, through the light that God has given him. If he follows that light, if he follows his conscience, he will be led to God. Remember in Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, he sat on a chariot reading what? He had a passage of Isaiah, but he didn't understand it. God sent him a missionary. God will send you a missionary if you're seeking God. And if for some reason that missionary won't go, or he's not there, or is unable, or you just, you know, there's not one there, you can still find God through your conscience, through the light that God gives to you. As we have read here in Romans 2, verse 5 to 11. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? The Chinese, the Japanese, the Muslims, the Indians, the Pakistanis, all these people that are not Christians, these unsaved sinners, they can all come to the knowledge of the true God if they sought their conscience in truth and honesty, in well-doing, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, eternal life. They can gain eternal life through the light that's been given to them if they follow it, they follow the truth and through their conscience. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. You follow a hell deserving religion like Islam or the Confucian religion or the Hindus or the Buddhists or the Roman Catholics they will lead you those religions those false religions will lead you to hell if you follow your conscience and you follow the light that God has given to you he'll lead you to God he'll lead you to Jesus Christ isn't it interesting Jesus says I am the light of the world turn to John 1 and with this we finish so there is no excuse even if you haven't got the Bible and you're in a country where there is no missionaries and you haven't got a copy of the scriptures you have no excuse not to believe in God if you go to hell it will be your fault not God's In the beginning, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Don't forget we've said creation declares God. Creation declares God. You need to read Psalm 19. Creation declares God. You need to read Romans 1 again. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, capital L, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man has a certain amount of light that he can believe in God. Every man has a certain amount of faith to believe in the true God. It is the false religions, it is the evolutionary teaching that educates people out of believing in the true God. Do you understand that? 
So that question can easily be answered. What about the sinner? What about the heathen who has never heard the gospel? According to Romans 2, verse 5 to 11. They have light. They have the light that God gives to every man. The faith, enough faith to believe in the true God. And if they seek the truth, God will lead them to himself every single time. It has nothing to do with the erroneous teachings of Calvinism, predestination before the foundation of the world. Nothing to do with eternal decrees that were before Genesis 1 verse 1. That is nonsense. God is a God of mercy. It's not a John Smith scenario. God is a God of mercy and he extends his love and his mercy to the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish in the lake of fire but have everlasting life. Let us pray.